Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the Disrupted Festival of Ideas. My name's Mary Fayton. Over the weekend, we're exploring ideas around truth. First of all, I want to acknowledge the fact that we are on Wajak Noongar country and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Today's program is filled with vibrant minds and to begin, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you Lee Sales AM. I was inclined to say that as an acclaimed and Walkley award-winning journalist whose interviewing was described by former ABC managing director Mark Scott as very skillful and very dangerous, <laughs> that Lee is best known for her full-time role as anchor of the ABC's flagship current affairs program, 730. But maybe Lee is best known for having achieved something quite extraordinary that breaks the mould of the serious senior journalist because she's carved out another perhaps equally loved role as one half of the Chat 10 Looks 3 podcast duo with her friend and colleague Annabelle Crabb. And this has developed another huge and I imagine not entirely overlapping community on, of its own right. Also, Lee Sales is author of three books, the most recent being The Truly Excellent Exploration into Human Resilience, Any Ordinary Day. The others, Detainee 002, explains the story of David Hicks, and a personal essay on the value of truth, scrutiny and accountability called On Doubt. So who knows which one of these reasons uh, Lee Sales is best known to you, but I'm confident that because you're here, you respect her work and all the way she goes about in the world. And that is no small accolade. Please give a warm welcome to Lee Sales AM. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out uh, on a gorgeous Sunday morning in Perth uh, to come and hear me speak. And thank you particularly to all the chatters who come and are so friendly and pop up and give me cookies and lovely treats. Thank you very much. I've been a journalist for 25 years and I've reported on every kind of story that you can imagine. Cyclones, floods, political upheavals, sporting scandals, crime cases, you name it. I've seen human beings face every sort of challenge that life can throw at them, and I've seen all of the different kinds of ways that they respond. And today, I want to tell you the main thing that all of that has taught me. It is simply that the day that turns a life upside down usually starts just like any other day. You open your eyes, swing your body out of bed, eat breakfast, get dressed and leave the house, your mind busy. You close the front door behind you and rarely is there a tingle of unease that something is off, that today is not going to be the ordinary day that it appears to be. And later, when the story is told of what happened next, it will start with the day's deceptive ordinariness, something that in hindsight will seem completely inexplicable. In 2014, I anchored two stories on 7.30 that were about events that happened on days that were so ordinary in the way that they began, that, but, but yet so inconceivable and unimaginable in the way that they ended, that they rattled, I think, every one of us. On the afternoon of November the 25th, which was a gorgeous day, not dissimilar to today, a young cricketer, Philip Hughes, was fatally struck by a ball during a game. And on the morning of December the 15th at morning tea time in a Sydney cafe, a gunman took 18 people hostage. And two of them, Katrina Dawson and Tory Johnson, were dead by the end of the siege. Philip Hughes just padded up as he'd done since childhood. Katrina Dawson left her law office to pop downstairs to have a hot chocolate with a friend. Tory Johnson was just going about his business on a regular day at work. Where was the last sign to exit the freeway, the chance to change course? It feels like the universe cheated these people by not warning them that this was not going to be an ordinary day. This was a day to stay home in bed. It wasn't an ordinary day at all. It was going to be a life-changing day. And the scary thing about it is that if the universe or fate, luck, God, happenstance, whatever you want to call it, didn't give them that warning, then it's probably not going to give it to you or to me either. 
There are choices that we all make in the full knowledge that they will alter the course of our lives, whether to get married or have children or move countries. We expect those kind of decisions to have consequences. The confronting thing about the Philip Hughes accident and the Lint Cafe siege were that the choices leading to disaster were so minor that they were barely worth contemplation. What family could imagine that a choice about whether to send their son to cricket or soccer when he was a boy was actually a decision about how long he would live? Who could possibly function if they had to wonder if going to meet a friend for a hot chocolate was going to be a matter of life and death? And we all make similar decisions without pause every moment of the day, whether to come and listen to this talk this morning, blessedly oblivious to the potential consequences of that. In my job as a journalist, and particularly as anchor of 7.30, I see every day of my working life that these kind of blind sides level the rich and the poor, the weak and the powerful, without discrimination. It would be unusual for any one of, this, any one of us in this room to escape life without one. The, the only thing that varies is usually the difference in scale and whether you land on a program like mine. Are you in the last days now? of what you might later come to think of as normal life. It's straightforward to grasp intellectually the idea that life can be turned upside down in an, in an instant, but it's very emotionally uncomfortable to be prodded sharply with that reality. And for me, the news stories that dominated the second half of the media cycle in 2014 did sharp me very prodly, and they, it was, sorry, prod me very sharply. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that they magnified the deepest truth of being alive, which is a fact that is both wonderful and terrible all at the same time, that we never know what's coming next. I know rationally that the news is not a mirror held up to life. I've been doing it long enough to know that. It's very selective. As one of my journalism lecturers told the class, 99 helicopters might fly completely safely today, but it's the one helicopter that doesn't that makes the news. But even knowing that, reporting horrible events for years at a time and days on end has made me quite fearful and anxious. In December 2014, particularly after the um, Hughes incident and the Link Cafe siege, I would lie awake at night and think about the people who'd recently found themselves in the news when their lives had been upended. And I found it hard to contemplate the questions that those tragedies raised. You know, why them? Why not me? It has to be my turn at some stage. When's it going to be my turn? What's going to happen to me? Something had happened in my own life at the start of 2014 that undoubtedly was contributing to my sense that my number had to be up at some stage. In February that year, I was about eight months pregnant and I woke up one night with a sharp pain in my side and a sense that something was wrong. I knew it wasn't labour because I'd already had one child. I headed to the hospital and the doctors ran various tests and the baby's heartbeat was fine and my vital signs were okay. There, there was some speculation, is it appendicitis or something like that. After a while, a couple of ultrasound technicians arrived and I could tell by their faces when they looked at the monitor that something must have been really wrong. At that stage, my pain was, was about three out of 10. It was just sort of discomfort, really. Um, I asked, what, what can you see? And they sort of fudged the answer a bit. And they said, oh, we can't really see much because there's something dark is blocking our view, which I assumed must be blood. My obstetrician arrived soon after, and he said something like, we don't know what's going on, but I think we just have to get you into theatre and get the baby out. And I'm just going to have to cut vertically straight up um, and we'll just see what's going on when we get in there and try to fix whatever it is, but we just don't know, and I'll call whatever specialists are needed when we get in there. So he left a scrub up, and then within a couple of minutes, I was floored by just an utterly blinding pain. It went from three to 10 instantly. I felt like my ribs were cracking one after the other. I was trying not to breathe as the slightest movement was excruciating. I still had the fetal heart rate monitor around my stomach and the midwife said something like, I've lost the baby's heartbeat and then she smacked a button on the wall. I desperately wanted to lose consciousness, partly because I was in so much physical pain, but also because it was very scary to see what happens when they push that emergency button on the wall. I'm sure if you're a medical person, there's probably got some order to it, but when you're not, it seems really scary because you feel like 
something must be really, really wrong for everyone to be acting like this. I was raised to theatre. I remember the lights flashing over my eyes. Somebody reached under the blanket and was holding my hand. Um, the last thing I remember seeing was my obstetrician walk in the door as someone was drawing a line up my stomach where they were about to cut. I, I was thinking, they're going to cut, I'm not asleep yet. When I woke, there was no baby to be seen. Um, I was on my back in a dimly lit room, which I later learned was a high dependency unit. Um, I could sense there was a tube going up one nostril. <laughs> Wow. Thank you very much to our security people for dealing with that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, fine. Yeah. I think it's just some yogurt or something. No, I'm fine. I'm quite happy to go on. If everyone else is all right, I'm quite happy to go on. Thank you. Right. That was a waste of some perfectly good yogurt, I'm afraid. Uh, right. Is everyone all right? Good. Okay. Um, so I woke up. I didn't know what was going on. I had a tube running up my nose and down the back of my stomach. Another tube was snaking out of bandages um, on my stomach, leaching fluid into a bag. Um, there was another uh, tube, a catheter. I had ox oxygen prongs in both nostrils, drips coming out of both hands. It was just a complete disaster in every way. I learnt later that the baby was in uh, the neonatal intensive care unit and that he'd been deprived of oxygen for a period. Um, there were fears that he had brain damage and they were doing what they could to mitigate against that. I'd had what's called a uterine rupture, which me means that basically it's what it sounds like, that your uterus splits and the contents just go into your abdominal cavity. I'd lost a massive amount of blood. By the time I woke up, I'd had three transfusions. Um, the doctors were concerned about the functioning of all of my internal organs, so I was very, very unwell. And then I was also just emotionally numb with shock about what had happened and what was going on with the baby. I broke down crying hysterically a couple of days after this happened and the nurses um, took pity and wheeled me in my bed with all of my paraphernalia down to the NICU where the baby was hooked up to all of his paraphernalia. The first photo of us is the most pitiful sight you could possibly imagine. My son can barely be seen under all the medical gear on him and I am unrecognisable. There's so much equipment attached to us both that I'm not really holding him, he's just lying on the bed next to me. I didn't understand that at the time because I was traumatised, but that experience caused me to lose my sense of security in the world and to a degree, my sense of self. And I should have turned immediately to friends um, for help and, and, and tried to make sense of it. Because here, here I was in my mind, this supposedly competent, independent person, you know, by reputation as well, not only unable to look after myself, but unable to care for my own children. And so the person that I considered myself to be self-sufficient and in control and able to handle things was in fact not who I had turned out to be. And so even though I knew that was irrational, um, I felt ashamed and weak. That experience changed me profoundly and the view of my life from uh, the other side of that cu couple of weeks in the hospital bed was not the same as the view of it before. The world didn't seem as safe as it once had and the possibility of death or catastrophe seemed real, not like distant things that I didn't need to worry about for the time being. And I should um, reassure you at this point that the baby was all right and he didn't end up with brain damage or developmental issues, he was okay. The experience of going through that amplified for me the questions with which the news confronts me every night. How do we come to terms with the fact that life can blindside us in an instant? When the unthinkable does happen, what comes next? How does a person go on? Do we as a community have a responsibility to people who unwittingly find themselves in the middle of a story that we all want to know more about? And once we truly understand that we are not exceptional and that we are instead as vulnerable as the next person, what does that tell us about how we should live? All of us will experience grief and suffering. It's part of the human 
package. I dread all of the anticipated losses of life, uh, like my mother's death, the slow decline of age, all of those kind of things. But those prospects don't terrify me as much as the idea of something unexpected happening, something that turns your life upside down instantly, like say if that man had actually had um, a gun or a knife or something like that. I was scared of it. I tried to avoid watching those kind of stories on my own program. I prefer, I've preferred to cover politics for most of my career rather than general news so I could avoid having to look at those kind of things front on. What prompted me to begin writing Any Ordinary Day was the thought of what might happen if I walked towards what I most feared rather than in the opposite direction. What would I learn if I spent time with people who had gone through some of the things that I most worried about happening to me or my family? What could the newest scientific research teach us about the way the human brain comes to terms with such things? It felt sort of like staring at the sun to me, but I wanted to do it and see what would happen if I didn't look away. During the writing of Any Ordinary Day, I met some incredible people, some of whom you would have heard of and some of whom you wouldn't. People shared the most extraordinarily intimate details of their life with me. They were so authentic and um, honest. And I think it's partly because in a lot of cases, people had been too scared to hear in detail about what had happened to them. But it, it's not um, a book that's a series of individual stories. It's more about how what I've learned has helped me come to terms with the idea that life can suddenly change for the worse and that almost certainly tragedy will come for me and will come for all of you one day. For me, one of the most fascinating things I had a chance to look at was the cutting edge psychological research into why we think the way we do about the kind of blind sides that land on the news. So why, for example, when we see something like the Lindt Cafe siege, do we feel like that could have been me, even though the chances of it being you are very small. Or when there's an accident like the Dreamworld roller coaster accident that claimed four people's lives in a very horrible manner, do we think things like, oh, I'll never go on a ride like that ever again, even though we take statistically more significant risks every day, like driving our car around? Or why does something like the death of Philip Hughes rattle the whole community, even though we don't personally know him, and the chances, um, well, chances are we don't play cricket or know anyone who plays cricket at the kind of level where you could get a fatal ball to the head? There is amazing research out there that answers all those kinds of questions. For all of recorded time, human beings have been fascinated by the intersection of destiny and chance, and they've craved ways to test and tame the fates. We hate to feel vulnerable, and so we seek reassurance any way we can. We read horoscopes, pray to gods, visit clairvoyance, consult tarot cards, check the weather forecast, scour news stories about our risks of contracting various diseases so we can do things to mitigate against them. Gambling can be dated back to 3500 BC. Um, and gamblers, along with people whose jobs involve precision or luck, um, such as soldiers or surgeons, sailors, um, frequently turn to superstitious rituals to give themselves a sense of protection. It's not just them either. I can't tell you how many times I've done something like approached a red traffic light and thought something like, if it turns green before I stop the car, I'll get the Prime Minister for that interview tonight. <laughs> if I end up stopping the car, okay, best of three. <laughs> Every day we all do silly things like that. We ascribe meaning um, to the most random meaningless events to give ourselves a sense of control over our world. Human brains have evolved to need predictability. Our ancient ancestors had to make dozens of decisions every day that went to their very survival, what food was good to eat, what shelter would be safe from the elements, what locations were safe from predators. Predictability was useful because it streamlined the decision-making process. Um, if a plant had been safely eaten, it could be safely eaten again. So the need for predictability was so strong that um, evolution has caused our brains to permanently want it. The brain gathers all sorts of data from the outside world and stores it as memories. And memories then help us make decisions about how to act by evaluating past experience against present reality. And that mental process occurs in a split second for something pretty straightforward like climbing a set of stairs, but it can be more torturous for complicated decisions such as whether another person is trustworthy. 
the brain likes patterns that it can recognise because they foster a sense of predictability in the world around us and it helps eliminate unpleasant feelings of insecurity or unfamiliarity. Lots of scientific experiments have proven this um, over the years. In one study, monkeys were given an option of um, pressing two coloured targets. One of them allowed them to see a reward that was coming down and the other one didn't. After a couple of days, they showed a clear preference to push the target where they could see what their reward was. In another experiment, human beings were found to prefer pushing a button that delivered a guaranteed small electric shock than pushing a button that might or might not deliver an electric shock. It's, we prefer to be able to brace ourselves for what we definitely know is coming rather than have the uncertainty. There's a chemical reason as well for this preference. When brains receive information that makes sense, they release the, ke the chemical dopamine, which makes us feel um, comfortable, uh, pleasurable, calm, content, satisfied, all those feelings. This human bias towards predictability and certainty causes us to look for cause and effect in the world around us. We want to know that things are predictable. And we do this even for things that defy an easy explanation. So when you see something like the Lint Cafe siege, people often will ask themselves questions afterward like, wow, you know, why, why, I, I sh could have been there that day. I used to go there. Why did I change my plans at the last minute and so forth? It must have happened for a reason, um, we often think. The idea that everything happens for a reason is a reassuring thought as if somewhere out there is a blueprint that dictates the course of our lives, even if we can't see it. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a greater sense of certainty in believing that things under some form of control, whether another being's or our own control, than it is um, to accept that it's not, that it's just random. Lots of people think it's more comforting to believe that things like um, how hard we work, the choices we make, or the goodness of our deeds influence our destiny more than straight luck and chance do. But does that kind of thinking square with the evidence? Lots of life-changing events, and just also, you know, regular ones, are arbitrary. The 18 people in the Lint Cafe that day didn't do something that meant they deserved to be there while you or I did not. Our brains are looking for a reason so it can satisfy its desire for cause and effect because something like the Lint Cafe shatters our feeling of individual security because how do we know that we wouldn't be in a cafe when a terrorist strikes? And the brain wants the feeling of security restored. Lots of unusual events like being the victim of a terrorist attack can be at least partially explained thanks to a mathematical theory called the law of large numbers. When you take an enormous group of people, um, a group in this instance being referred to as a sample, the chance of an extremely rare event happening is greatly magnified simply because of the massive size of the sample. So a one in a million chance of something um, happening to you on paper looks pretty rare. But Australia's population is 25 million. So if every year in Australia only one one in a million uh, chance event occurs, 25 Australians will experience that event. The law of large numbers explains why something that might feel personally highly significant to you might not in fact be that unique. Say you dreamed that a friend died and the next day you found out that the friend had indeed passed away. You would no doubt find that very, very unique and think it meant something. Yet in 2003, a British statistician calculated the odds of dreaming about a friend's death on the night that it happens. He based his maths on Britain's population size at the time, which was 55 million, which is a gigantic sample. And he assumed an average of one dream of a friend's death per lifetime. And then he factored in the national death rate of 2,000 every 24 hours. Crunching those numbers, the odds of an accurate death dream in Britain are one every two weeks. Given the size of the global population, the law of large numbers means that Lint Cafe style events are sadly common. What it doesn't mean is that we are more likely to be caught in one ourselves. Our planet is the ultimate large sample size, and with so many of us, any one individual's chance of being the victim of the kind of blindside that lands in the news is still small. But our brains make the prospect seem more likely than it is because they're putting unusual events, the ones that defy past patterns that are uncertain and unpredictable and therefore make us uncomfortable, it's putting all of those in neon lights. Before I run out of time, I want to tell you briefly about just one of the incredible people I met when I was writing Any Ordinary Day. 
one of the main things I tried to do with this book is to ask questions that I feel like we would all like to ask at times, but that it would be socially inappropriate to ask or that we would just find too difficult to ask. So, for example, when somebody has lost their entire family, what stops them from killing themselves? When you arrive home from work and there are police waiting at your house to tell you that your husband has been killed, what happens next? Do they stick around? Do they just go? Do they come in? How long do they stay? How do they actually break that news? And if you're the police officer who has that job, what's that like for you? Do you have a game plan that you use every time? How do people react when you tell them? Is there any common pattern of reaction? Often I would meet a person and they would say that when something dreadful had happened to them, it felt like they'd been plonked into a foreign land. And in that foreign land, they would sometimes meet people who seemed to speak the language and that would be incredibly helpful and almost like a lifeline. And so then I would track down those people and speak to them too about how they handled it. One person who I met who was really fascinating was a detective with the New South Wales Homicide Squad. And in his job, he frequently had to go to people's houses to tell them that a loved one had been killed. His name is Graham Norris. I'd interviewed a woman named Juliet Darling, whose partner, Nick Waterlow, had been murdered by his schizophrenic son. And the murderer then went on the run and Graham Norris was involved in the manhunt and then he was involved in the trial and then a coronial inquest afterwards when the man was finally apprehended. Graham Norris was quite amazing. I could not imagine doing his job for one second. Um, he was a tall guy with a shaved head and a big bushy beard, like a bushranger. He'd been a late starter in the police. Um, he got into the force in 1997 at age 35 after a career in sales. He'd always wanted to be a policeman, but his parents had found it too dangerous, so he'd taken a different path to keep them happy, but eventually couldn't let go of the dream, and so he became a police officer. I asked him, he, he worked his way up through the police and eventually got to homicide, and I asked him if before he went to homicide, he was scared of things like being around dead bodies. And he said he was apprehensive about having to watch post-mortems because he used to get queasy when he had to get a needle, which of course was making me think, oh my God, massive call to go to homicide. Um, but he said he got around it because he felt that the work was meaningful and important. And he realized that as a human being, he had the capacity to do it. And he knew that not everybody did have that capacity. I asked him what it was like to have to go and tell somebody that a family member had been killed. He said it was always really difficult and he called it delivering a death message. He said you get trained for it at the police academy, but you really learn how to do it once you actually get out there in the field. For example, he said through experience, he learned that when you're delivering news like that, you have to be very, very direct because people will, their brains will try to find any way of avoiding dealing with that news. And so if you say something like, I'm sorry, your son's been in a fatal car accident. People will often say, is he okay or who died? You have to say, I'm sorry, there's been a fatal car accident. Your son has been killed, as hard as that is. He said, no matter how long you've been a police officer, you never want to say it. You're always afraid when you're giving that news how people will respond. But he said there's not really any predictability. You get the full range of things. One time he went to somebody's house and said, I'm sorry, your father's been killed. And the person replied, that's the best news I've ever had. Would you like to come in for a coffee? <laughs> Graham was like, no. <laughs> Graham Norris had the most incredibly emotionally intelligent approach to his job. When he was walking from his car to somebody's front door and he knew that he was about to upend their life, but they were on the other side of that door and they had no idea it was coming, he had a principle that would guide him. It was the idea that he was going to be one of the people who was going to have to get this victim of crime to their new normal. They didn't know it yet, but their normal life was about to be shattered. They would want it back, but they would never be able to get it back. He would try to help them adapt, not on the first day, of course, but over time to this new normal. He would say to them after a while, we have to try to find a way for you to make a life with this new set of circumstances. I'll tell you exactly what he said to me because I just thought it reveals what an amazing person he was. He said, this is a long process they're entering into. The legal process is going to be counted in years, not months, and for them it's a lifetime of change. I've always felt a strong responsibility, a heavy responsibility to look after these people. You'd love to be able to say, I'm gonna get you the outcome you want, you'll be happy at the end of all of this, but that just doesn't happen. 
So if the person that I'm looking after, if we get to the end of whatever process and it's not the outcome they wanted or expected, they might feel disappointed in that, but at least they won't feel disappointed in the way I've looked after them. In 2014, after my terrifying birth experience, I started to think I was jinxed. When my son was six weeks old, he contracted viral meningitis and we were back in hospital. Two months after that, another blind side, not the baby though, his two-year-old brother, his daycare centre called me in to say that they had noticed a tremor in his hands and that has led to years of visits to hospitals and doctors and therapists and so forth, which that's another story, I'll leave that for him to tell one day. The little guy is now um, just a totally rambunctious five-year-old who runs the house and he's developing neurotypically, which is what, how I've learned a medical profession describes a child I previously would have said was normal. <laughs> and then amidst all of that, when it felt like things couldn't get worse, my marriage of almost 20 years collapsed. When I started thinking about writing Any Ordinary Day, I was frightened by what had happened to me, how rapidly and thoroughly my life had been upended. I was scared of what was on my own television program every night, how fickle and cruel the world often seemed. And mostly I was worried about what's going to happen next, what if something else goes wrong, something even worse. If you do a job like mine, or you spend a lot of time in children's hospitals, you become acutely conscious that there's always something worse that can happen to you. Lately, I've also noticed among friends and even strangers a bit of a desire to stop reading or watching the news um, because the world seems so unstable and dangerous nearly two decades into the 21st century that it's easier to switch off and to watch things that make us laugh or feel good instead of more and more anxious all the time. I can completely understand that compulsion to look away and so it was sort of surprising to me when I embarked on this book that I was choosing to do the opposite, which was to walk towards pain and suffering rather than away from it. Now that I know more about how our brains work, I think that it was probably an unconscious effort on my part to impose control and to get control back over my life. I felt like, oh, once I can understand everything that I'm scared of, then I'll regain control. Instead, actually, I've become much more comfortable with not having control and I'm more accepting of that. I did wonder at the start of the process if I were making a mistake, if meeting all the people that I met would, and, and asking about all the deep blows they'd sustained would tip me over the edge and then I'd be crushed under the weight of all these tragic stories and never get out of bed again. Instead, amazingly, the opposite happened. It's given me hope. What people can get through is truly amazing. I've been completely stunned and astonished by what I've learned, um, and I'm sure that all of you would be stunned and astonished by the lessons from these people's lives too, and the thing that I've taken from it, and I think that the thing that I can say to all of you with great confidence is that you are all far stronger than you could ever imagine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lee. And I'm very sorry about the yoga. Oh, thank fine. you. Thank you for keeping on going <laughs> oh, so it's fine. boldly. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear more about what you learned in writing this book because they, they were harrowing stories that, that you sought out. And I know they were ones that you chose because they, they featured in the media for over a long period of time. Um, what did it do to you? Um, I think it gave me a sense of, um, there were a few things. One is that life is good and bad at the same time. Um, that I think in my head I'd sort of felt like, oh, well, things must be going well, and then if a bad thing happen to, happens to you, like a really terrible thing like losing a child, that then everything about your life ever after that moment is bad. But actually... It, life doesn't work like that. It's good and bad at the same time. And even every person in this book, when terrible things happen to them, in the midst of all of that tragedy, there would be things that would um, still deliver them. Um, I don't know if joy is the right word because it's not in that context, but other people's kindness would give them, I guess, hope, a glimmer of hope that at some point life might return to being a little bit better than what it was. Um, I think I also learned, I interviewed a priest um, who said something to me that really stayed with me about 
the need to... Because he, he was someone... Um, Graham Norris that I mentioned before, Juliet Darling, who was the victim of the crime in that instance, she nominated Graham Norris and this priest, Father Steve Sin, as the two people who she felt could help her and understand. And um, Steve Sin, she just said every time he spoke or he did something, he just did the right thing. And I think because most of us feel like when we're dealing with people in the midst of grief or pain, we don't know what to say and we feel worried that we say the wrong thing. So I asked Graham, how did you know what to say? And he found it sort of hard to answer. He couldn't really articulate it. But he did say to me, all you need to do is a company. Like, don't be worried. Are you saying the right or the wrong thing? It's not about you. It's about the other person. You just have to show up and be there. And I found that um, just sort of, it seems obvious, but it was quite a revelation. And I've found subsequently when friends are having difficult things happen, I'm less scared to be with them because I just view it as part of the friendship because if you're there sort of for good times, it seems completely wrong that you wouldn't be there for when they're going through a bad time, as awkward or difficult as what that might be. Um, I think also that I learned that um, sometimes at these moments, it is the kindness of other people that will carry you through and you have to be able to accept that. Because I think we're all sort of a bit conditioned when people offer help to go, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, I don't want to be a bother. But actually, sometimes it's okay to be a bother and to just say, yes, thanks, that would be great. Yeah, and it's a matter of charging in. I've heard you say this before, that you just have to charge in and do whether you end up doing the right thing or not in terms of your interaction with that person who's going through the traumatic experience, that you just have to be there. Well, and just um, you have to be sensitive about it, but things also like, um, for example, if you say to somebody, oh, could I, could I cook a dinner and drop it off? Like, who doesn't want to get a lasagna dropped off for their freezer? The thing is to not hang around like just drop it on the doorstep and text and say just left a lasagna on your doorstep or ask the person do you want me to stay do you want me to go um could I fold that washing for you it's it's being sensitive and attuned to the other person but a lot of people in this book felt like when something terrible had happened to them and for these people the magnitude of terrible things was really high it was like Walter Mickack say who in Port Arthur his wife and his three-year-old and his six-year-old were all killed he found that friends fled because they, they just did not know what to say. And, and Walter said to me, people would say years later, I was just, I was scared I'd make it worse. And he'd be thinking, my wife and my three-year-old, my six-year-old just got killed. How do you think you can make that worse? Um, it's a very self-centered way of um, looking at things. How about as an interviewer and in your role at 7.30, have you noticed anything that you could clearly associate with the work of any ordinary day in a change in the way that you approach interviews or your your willingness to be empathic? I'm now, I mean, nobody enjoys interviewing someone if they've been through a trauma or they're in the midst of a trauma because it's just sad and, and it's difficult. But I do feel heaps more able to do it because if the person's in the sort of acute period of when they're dealing with something awful, I have a sense, because I've met all these other people, that it's not the rest of their life, that as bad as it is at the time, that they will at a certain point, um, most people, not everybody, but people do adapt over time. Now, they're never going to go back and be the same person they were before. They're never going to be completely happy. Once you've had a terrible tragedy in your life, there's always just a bit of you that is affected by that. But the vast bulk of people do adapt. And so that gives me some comfort when I'm talking to them. But also, um, I feel like I've learnt a lot about how to just give people the space to talk about what's happened to them. And I'll often say to people, why, why are you doing this interview? Like, tell me what you want to get out of this. And I'll make sure that I ask the questions that you feel like it's been worth your time. Because if someone's coming on to talk about their wife being killed in a terrible accident and there's a coronial inquest and they've been harangued by the media and they've finally decided they want to do 7.30 and that's going to be painful for them to rehash things. I want to make sure that they feel like it's been worth the effort to do it. Um, and so things like just, I've learned, you just try to give people space and you try to not have a pre-prepared list of questions. You try to follow wherever they're going and just let them talk about what they want. I mean, that's no small undertaking when you're time limited as you are on 7.30 as well, because there's always a sense with those, those big, enormous stories that they are by nature reductive when you talk about them in a seven minute block. So how do yeah. you, how do you actually de deliver that to someone? We would never do an interview like that live. 
we would always um, edit it. So we would go and, you know, I'll talk to someone for as long as it takes. I try to not talk too long because that's also, you know, you're draining the person. So I try to listen and feel like, okay, I know I've covered what the average person at home would want to know. And so then I'll feel like I can draw it to a natural conclusion. So we might go for 20 25 minutes and then um, edit it down to seven. But an interview like that, you can't rush the person. So it can't be like a political interview where you're sort of interrupting and driving it forwards all the time. You've got to just let them sit back. So yeah, we just would never do it live. Mm. Uh, talking about truth, I'm really interested in how you've thought about truth differently doing these interviews where you've, you've sat with someone who's gone through a, a tragic experience. Uh, in the sense, we, did you ever doubt that what they were telling you was the truth? No, I've never had that experience when someone's been a victim of a crime or something terrible. I mean, I'm sure other journos have, but I just have not had somebody where I've felt like, oh, they're exaggerating or they're not telling the truth. There's sort of, there's something where you can just get a sense of somebody's authenticity or decency. And again, because I do lots of different styles of interviews on 7.30, it's not like if someone's telling you about their subjective experience of what it's like to be a police officer knocking on someone's door, it's not like a political interview where they're telling me why this policy is going to do X, Y, Z and I've got facts from the Treasury Department that contradict what they're saying that I then can challenge them with. So it's a totally different thing. But no, I haven't personally had that experience where I've had any sort of gut sense that, oh, this doesn't ring true. But you've also talked about how, through all of your experience, you've you d described the process as thin slicing, as in just making those micro decisions. Yeah, in um, on doubt. Um when I was Washington correspondent for the ABC, George W. Bush was the president and he all the time would be talking about his gut. Like, my gut tells me that, you know, we've got to go into Iraq or my gut tells me that Saddam Hussein's an evil man or whatever. And um, your gut, obviously, you know, we call it our gut, but it's our brain. Um, your gut is only a useful tool when you are using it, when you're using your instinct to assess something that you've done many, many, many times before. So, for example, my gut in an interview with a politician about whether I should interject or interrupt is pretty good because I've done it hundreds of times so I can gauge that fairly well. Um, what my gut wouldn't be good for is if a fire alarm went off knowing, oh, should we evacuate or not evacuate? I'm not really sure. Like if I said, oh, my gut is that everything will be okay, let's stay in here. That's a stupid way to use my gut because I have no experience of fires, fire drills, buildings, um, anything like that. So it struck me that it seemed odd that George Bush was relying on his gut because he'd never been president, he'd never been in the military, like it was a bad thing to rely on. When we say, um, oh, I made a split second um, decision and it was the right decision, uh, like there was, I, I used in the book an example of a tennis coach who, if he were watching a player or a replay of a match, he could tell with accuracy, like close to 100% of the time, when the person was serving, when they threw the ball into the air, before the racket even connected, he could tell if it was going to be a fault. And it was because he had had so much experience in tennis and watching people that his brain did a thing called thin slicing, which is every, somewhere in your brain is every tennis match, every serve you've ever watched before, and in an absolute millisecond, your brain goes, brrr, runs through all of that, and it can then pull all that data together and go, fault. And it's hard to say, you can't say, or it, you possibly could if you slowed it down and watched it, um, you know, on a television set. But it's not like with gut you go in the split second, oh, it's because um, the ball was at the wrong position or the racket's at the wrong position. If you slowed it down, you might be able to explain that. But normally with your gut, your brain's moving so fast that it's just a sense that I just know that that's not going to work and it's hard to explain it. So that's what thin slicing is. <laughs> I, um, I love the fact that in any ordinary day you've supported uh, the, the stories with searching out for statistics that you know can show you what, what are the chances of these things happening to you and you talked a little bit about that. One in particular was Stuart Diver, the only survivor of the Threadbow landslide and how he'd lost his first wife in the landslide and then lost his second wife to breast cancer and you tell us about searching for those stats. So... Stuart, um, who's a lovely bloke, um, when we met, he said something really close to the start of the conversation, which really made my heart go out to him, which was, he said, I know nobody, you know, nobody says this to my face, but I know that everyone thinks it behind my back. They're all thinking, geez, who'd sign up to be the third Mrs. Diver? <laughs> and 
I just felt really sorry for him that that you know, and I'm you know, frankly, I know that people would say that because when I was telling people I was interviewing Stuart Diver, they'd be like, "Oh man, you wouldn't go out with him, would you?" Like everyone's jinx, blah blah blah. And so I felt like this, right? You know, I know jinxes are BS. I'm gonna prove it. So I rang up the Australian Bureau of Statistics and said. I want you to help me calculate the odds that Stuart Diver's third wife would die. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that the Michael Wilson at the ABS hung up the phone and went, oh God, it's Lee Sales again, <laughs> bloody hell. So um, the first thing we worked out was, and it was quite complex to do, um, it's that there is no link between Stuart wives Stuart Diver's wife's dying and his next wife potentially dying. It's like if you throw a coin into the air um, and you throw it and it's heads, the fact that you've just landed heads doesn't make it more or less likely that the next time you're going to land heads. They're all discrete individual events. So the third Mrs Diver should have no fear for her longevity based on the first two Mrs Divers. And also Stuart, he lost his first wife in an incredibly rare freak event for which nobody could possibly blame Stuart Diver himself. His second wife died in one of the most common ways women in that age group die, which is breast cancer. So he had one very rare event followed by one very common event. So that was, you know, unusual for him. And so it's more bad luck than any sort of cause and effect type thing. Um, then I sort of flipped it, well, is it worth Stuart's chances of, of getting married a third time because what his, what's his risk of being a widow yet again? And when you sort of crunch the numbers on that, um, basically the biggest risks to, if Stuart married someone of the same age of him, as him, the biggest risks would be um, death from uh, lung cancer, breast cancer or suicide. But really, while you can't say Stuart's guaranteed a happy ever after ending, the, the person next person most likely to die in the diver household is Stuart himself because men are more likely in Australia to die before their wives for a range of women uh, reasons. So um, really, I, I rang Stuart at the end when I'd done it and he was like, oh great, well maybe I should take that down the pub. <laughs> um, Michael Wilson at the Bureau of Statistics when I, I sent him what I'd written because it was really complex to work it out um, and he said, he replied and said, that is a flawless piece of logic but I bet people still go, yeah, well I still think Stuart Diver's jinxed. <laughs> I want to make a really clunky segue from that into asking you about your practice of, of pulling together facts to go into interviews in the 7.30 context because I know that, you, you know, sometimes you, spend, you can kind of walk into these interviews and you've got a body of knowledge there already, but others you actually spend a lot of time researching with your producer Callum to pull together absolutely everything you need to know to have this conversation. Yeah, so if it's, say, um, an interview with... Um, like to the Treasurer or the Prime Minister, and let's say they're talking about how great the economy's been under the Liberal uh, government and how bad it was under Labor. I'll be doing things like pulling unemployment statistics, pulling figures on the size of Australia's debt. So I'm all the time trying to respond to them with quantifiable facts from sources like the Treasury Department or the Bureau of Statistics so that they can't say, um, well, Lee, you know, you might say that, because I want to be able to go, no, I'm not saying it, I'm quoting you from the 2017 Treasury Papers or something like that. So I still, um, even though I think, I, I worry about where we're going in this sense, but I mean, I still believe in facts and science and reason and logic and all of those kind of things. Um, and so, and, and I, you know, like to believe, perhaps naively, that the audience still believes in all of that too. And so I try to arm myself like that in dealing with, you know, whether it's a politician or um, a business person or, or anybody that's going to present sort of their point of view, I try to come at it as best I can with independent um, factual analysis. So I was just thinking about, uh, I guess, what your understanding of post-truth is and whether you actually have had the experience of being in an interview where you've gone, what just happened in that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are people who are hard to interview. Like Donald Trump, I think, would be really hard to interview because when I say, like, I like operating in the realm of reason and fact, <laughs> no, no, 99 out of 100 people, if you are interviewing them and you say, um, you just said this and now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say this, 
they will respond, whether they're sort of spinning or not. It's sort of a back and forth conversation where each person's responding to the other. There are some people that you interview, and Donald Trump would definitely be one, where it wouldn't matter what you asked, they just go off on some tangent. And if you're someone who applies logic and reason, I mean, I'm sure you've all probably just had conversations with people like this. You try to follow where they're going and then ask something that relates to that, but then they just flit off on something else. And so that is a really difficult kind of... Clive Palmer is another example of someone like that. Very hard to interview and you have to keep trying to pull them back, but it becomes impossible because they don't sort of engage on that kind of a, a level. So that's my least favourite kind of interviewee because you feel like you can't really get anywhere and you can't, for the audience, get to any sort of fundamental truth. This is a bit more of a philosophical question about obtaining truth in in a journalistic sense. But um, I was thinking about the fact that we're always encouraged to find an angle on a story and whether the instant w that we try to find an angle on a story, we're already manipulating the truth of the story. Yeah. Um, and I think as I've gotten more experienced as a journalist, I've become better at trying to be open uh, to where a story might go. But I guess for 7.30, because of, if you're doing a, a live interview, the limited amount of time means you are picking an angle because you're deciding, all right, well, out of all of the various facts or things I could ask, say, the Prime Minister about, here's what I'm choosing to focus on. So you are sort of making value judgments about what you think um, is important. That's why I said in my speech that I know that the news is not an objective presentation of reality because I know myself every day I'm making judgments about what I think should be, you know, is worth being asked about. And I know that there'd be people who would disagree and think, because I get told all the time on social media, why didn't you ask about blah, blah, blah? Um, and it's just because it's a very subjective uh, thing. The chapter in Any Ordinary Day about truth begins with you telling the story about James Scott. Uh, and I'm really interested in that, and I'll ask you to tell that story, but in the context of times when people don't tell the truth for a good reason, yeah, so James Scott, um, for anyone, probably people don't know the name, but if I said the guy who got lost in the Himalayas with the Mars bar, you'd go, oh, the Mars bar guy. So James Scott was a medical student in uh, Brisbane in um, the early 90s. He went on a uh, sort of what today would be called like an internship at a hospital in Nepal. He went hiking with some friends. They thought it was a day hike, so he was ill-prepared. He didn't have appropriate gear. Um, didn't have enough food or water, and then he got separated from um, his travelling companions and then he got lost. And he was lost for 43 days in unbelievably horrendous conditions. Um, and he sort of applied some of his knowledge as a medical student that enabled him to survive, but by the end he was in catastrophic physical condition, suicidal. Um, he was eventually found in a helicopter flyover. And by that point, the media had sort of given him up for dead. Um, and then when he was discovered, it was this massive, one of the most massive stories of my career, absolute frenzy to get James Scott's first interview. And what happened was, and James, I think, to this day is still pretty scarred by this experience. He's now a psychiatrist um, in, at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, a teenage um, psychiatry. He... He, you know, he has continuing injuries from that. He has um, double vision. His eyes sort of flicker back and forth. Um, he had wanted to be a surgeon. He had to give that up because he couldn't, because um, of his injuries. So when he was rescued, um, his family, they weren't a media savvy family. So they didn't know the first thing about coping when you are inundated with media asking for your story. And so they ended up, at the time, Harry and Miller was the sort of only known, I guess, media agent. So the family appointed Harry and Miller to take calls. And this story had sort of taken root from James's rescue because there was very little information. And it was that, oh my God, how did this guy survive? It was such an incredible tale. And this thing started going around that it was because he, he had, the only food he had was a Mars bar. Or, and that was the rumour, but everyone wanted to know real, what was the actual chocolate bar. Seems such a strange thing to get obsessed about, but it was a gigantic story. Um, James was not really in any fit physical state to do an interview, um, but it was just that the interest was so overwhelming and it was just sort of crippling. The hospital was, you know, struggling to function because of the amount of media. And Harry and Miller had said to James, um, okay, I've broken a deal with 60 Minutes. The family needed money because they'd spent a fortune. His parents had mortgaged the house to continue the search for James. Um, so they needed money. James wasn't sure if he would ever be able to work again because his injuries were so bad. 
So they did a deal with 60 Minutes and Harry and Miller said to James, whatever you do, when Richard Carlton asks you what's the brand of chocolate bar, don't say because we might be able to get an endorsement later. And James was just not like, he didn't understand how media works, he was sick. So he did the interview with Richard Carlton and what happened was Richard Carlton asked him what's the brand of chocolate bar and James wouldn't answer and it got really testy and it became one of the most famous exchanges in 60 Minutes history. And then it turned into, and this is where I think James is so hurt, that he feels like, and he does, have the most incredible survival story and all anyone ever remembers about it is the Mars bar. And so I guess for him, the truth of what happened to him was completely overwhelmed by this minor um, fact. And James fully accepts that, you know, his family made some decisions that were wrong and he made some decisions that were wrong, starting from, you know, going on the hike ill-equipped. But nonetheless, um, he felt like his truth got completely lost. Whereas Stuart Diver, also used Harry and Miller five or six years later, but he had a completely different experience. And Stuart feels like that was the best thing he ever did because he also didn't know how to deal with media. And he felt like his story was um, sort of portrayed in a way that, uh, you know, he was the sole threadbow survivor, that you can get through anything if you just sort of use your willpower and so forth. And so he felt like in all of the years that he's been a public figure that nothing bad's really ever been written about him and he credits Harry and Miller with having set up that framework. So he had a very different experience to James. Just before we go to questions, I do want to... I was interested in your reflection on the situation between Richard Carlton and James Scott that you felt you would have pursued the interview in the same way that Richard Carlton did. Yeah, because... So I went through it all with James and then I went away and thought about it and I got um, very kindly the EP of 60 Minutes sent me the archive of the whole story so I could watch it. And I felt that I would have asked the same thing, possibly not as aggressively as Richard, but definitely would have asked about what brand of chocolate bar because... Rightly or wrongly, that had become a very big part of the story and the public was dying to know what it was. And um, I felt that if I had worked for 60 and we had paid James for the story and then he came and was withholding information, I would feel, no, no, we've paid you to tell your story. Why are you not telling it? So I felt that I would have asked the same kinds of questions. And I didn't want to blindside James by writing that in the book without telling him that. So I sent him an email to say, this is how I feel about it. I, you know, I feel like a bad person because you've told me how much suffering that caused you, all of that. And what do you think about that? And he, he replied a really gracious reply and said, you know, of course you would have asked about it because that's the nature of your profession and it had become an improbable thing. But I just want people to know that it was a bigger, you know, experience than what brand of chocolate bar I had. And that, and that truly eating the chocolate was irrelevant. James did actually tell me, and he had never publicly said before, what kind of chocolate it was. And it was not a Mars bar. It was plain Cadbury dairy milk. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I haven't left very much time for questions, unfortunately. But um, can I just ask if, if you could just indicate if you have a question, just wait for the microphone. And if you wouldn't mind just standing up to ask your question, only questions that would be of interest to everybody else in the audience and no statements. If you make a statement, I will leave you to the 7.30 attack dog. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Does anyone have a question now that I've just said that? <laughs> There was one down here. Do oh, we stand yes. up and we yeah. can bring Yeah, have we got here? a microphone that we can pass? Yes. And then there's another one here. Ah, oh, okay. Thank you. That might even be all we've got time for. My name is Daniel. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you talk about empathy a lot in, the, uh, in your presentation. Um, do you, I often see in the political climate that empathy is distanced or players do. Do you have a comment or a thought on that in terms of how empathy is played with? Um... I don't, I haven't really thought about it actually in the context of the political climate. One of the things that I do find tricky in politics is the idea of always looking at things through your own ideological prism and not necessarily seeing that there's another way to look at it. It's one of the things that I really dislike about politics in Australia, which is the sort of, I guess, two party, two major party adversarial sort of system that if they say black, you have to say white, even though maybe black in this case has some merits. Um, so to me, empathy comes from the ability to, um, you know, imagine yourself in somebody else's position. Um, and so sometimes I wonder if the sort of ideological straight jacket prevents people from seeing things from other people's positions, um, but I haven't really given it deep thought. And another question just here. 
Hi, my name is Natalia. Um, I've already declared my love for you at the book signing. <laughs> um, I just, um, I find it interesting that your book has resonated with so many people across Australia, and yet we continue to really struggle to support people through loss and grief and tragedy. Um, do you have any thoughts on, or ideas on how we can get better at doing that as a community? Um, I'm, I feel really glad for the people who participated in this book that it has resonated and that it has sparked a conversation because I think part of the problem is that we don't talk about these things because they make us uncomfortable. Um, and so I think the mere fact that we're all here today talking about this stuff is good because it does need to be talked about because, you know, frankly, most of us are really ill-equipped to know how to deal with a friend who has terminal cancer or somebody whose child has committed suicide. And so I think the more we talk about these things and also have, as I said in the talk, have that sense that that could be you. <laughs> like, it's not... I, th I think... I know I did before 2014. I think I walked a little bit through life with some sort of magical thinking that, oh yeah, well that, that would never happen to me. Whereas now I have a much more acute sense that any, any type of thing I see on my show could happen to me. Um, so I think just, yeah, have it, having these kind of conversations I think is good. And I'm, I'm happy for the people, because every person in this book who participated, I think did it because they felt like when something bad happened to them that people didn't know how to deal with it. And they felt like they had so much to share and had learnt so much. Um, and so I'm really happy for them that what they had to say has actually found an audience. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have because Lee will be back at quarter past 12 on the panel Speak Your Truth, which is going to be chaired by Narelda Jacobs and also includes author Bree Lee and journalist Melissa Davey. I'll just encourage you maybe in the next 15 minutes, if you're not wanting to save your seat, to maybe check out Virtual Wadjuk in the corner there to find out more about what this land was like prior to white settlement. And please thank Lee Sales AM. Thank you.